Hey, it's Big John R. Buy, sell, trade, and give stuff away on Swap Shop, Saturday mornings at 7 on the talk station. Viewpoints on the talk station, FM 107, AM 1240. This afternoon, we're talking with um, a, a representative of, of the, an economics professor, as a matter of fact, professor of economics from Johnson and Wales University in Charlotte, North Carolina, Professor Adam Smith. He's the assistant professor of economics there, and we've had him on the air with us in the past. And with that, Professor Smith, thank you for taking the time to be with us. We appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. Always happy to be on your program, Lockwood. Yesterday, we were talking with the folks from the North Carolina Justice Center. Alan Fryer, about the topic of the economy and, uh, in fact, a, a recent report that was released uh, indicating that North Carolina's economic numbers were improving. As a matter of fact, I've seen stories today from various political sources promoting the fact that our economy has improved. Yet, uh, Alan Fryer was making some rather cautious, and I would also argue, even dispiriting remarks in the fact that what many of these, what these numbers really indicate are the number of people that the labor force has contracted and that there are more discouraged employees out there, or future employees out there. And I'm wondering, is, is this a natural envir- a situation in light of the fact that we've been eight years into a major recession and in the process we're now just beginning to, and, and I say eight years, I guess really the, the closest number is seven years, but we're just now beginning to get our feet back. This issue of a discouraged workforce, is this a natural phenomenon or is this something that is relatively new? Well, um, you know, let's speak to, to what, we, what we know has happened. We, we know that since the Great Recession, we have a, a much leaner, meaner economy where firms are doing more with less. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, one thing that, that, that happened um, is that lots of people were laid off. The businesses, of course, still had to run. Um, and so productivity increased with um, the labor that they had in place. And since the recession, one thing that has been difficult is that once the recession ended, all the all the jobs didn't come roaring back. You know, um, as as I'm sure you know, Lockwood, there's there's uh, the the unemployment rate has been um, very very slow and dropping, um, and we are we are still not to the point we were um, in the mid 2000s. Um, so that's what I'd say is 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 the the situation that we're dealing with. Um, and a part of that is going to be, you know, firms are using capital inputs more than labor. So they're using uh, machines and equipment and other things to sort of do the parts that, that, that labor used to do um, because they learned to do so during the recession. And since the recession is over, um, they're sticking with that approach. Well, all right. Uh, several aspects of this. One, we were looking at a bubble that uh, economists now agree was unsustainable. And uh, so many businesses were expanding beyond uh, a logical boundary, if you will. And uh, so there has been this retraction. And of course, obviously, folks are thinking about going back to the circa 2001, 2005, well, 2002, 2005. Remember, in the midst of all this, as I recall, 2001, we were prepping for a uh, possible recession at that time. And of course, then mm-hmm. 9-11 occurred. Uh, there was a ramp up as a result of a ramp up of military investment and security investment as a result of 9-11. So uh, that kind of uh, forestalled, I would say, and I'm just going to throw this. Did it? Did it? Did that event forestall the in, impending recession that many had begun begun to predict as early as 2001, and then it finally, of course, hit with a vengeance, uh, 2007, 2008. My your observations about those comments. Well, I think it's a stretch to link those two recessions. You know, I mean, you okay. identified a lot of the things that were immediately uh, responsible. Um, but the real issue with the recent recession, recession what makes it different is it's um, the background in finance. You know, all the things that were happening um, in the financial world and in real estate um, and in the housing market. Now, the seeds of that were being sown at that time, in the early 2000s, even with the Bush administration. Um, but I wouldn't say that was responsible for the earlier uh, blip we had um, around okay. 9-11. Um, this was definitely a special recession. And what makes it, what it 
What makes it uh, especially bad now after the recession is when you have a financial crisis, people are not only in the recovery period, people are still nervous. Mm-hmm. You know, firms are still nervous. And kind of going along with my comment a second ago, one reason why firms are reluctant to go back to the old way of doing things is, um, you know, they've they've figured out a way to make it work since the recession, and they don't want to abandon that because it's just not the time to take major well, financial risks. Also, are we looking at, as I, I keep uh, look, calling it, industrial revolution, or as one of uh, one of my panel likes to call it a technical and and a communications revolution. I want to get into that in a moment. Again, to remind everyone, our guest, Professor Adam Smith, Assistant Professor of Economics at Johnson & Wales University there in Charlotte. And uh, we do welcome him for this program this evening. I thank him for taking the time to be with us. Professor Smith, the... The fact that um, we are looking at um, a paradigm, I describe it, in, in every activity, um, we're seeing robotics, we're, you know, the development of drones, for example, uh, mm-hmm. and, and the new technology involved in that. Now, we've, and, and you, you've said a few moments ago, we're doing more with less in the way of people. We, we've become less and less of a, um, a manufacturing um, society and country have we not? And in the process, are we facing a new structure, if you will, economic structure? Well, I think you're definitely on to something there. There's a, um, there's a great book out by a former professor of mine, Tyler Cowan, called uh, Average is Over. Uh, uh-huh. Which should be especially scary to uh, your uh, your youth panelists that you that you have on Monday nights. But um, you know the the thesis that that Cowan puts forward is that it's just that is that average is over that um, robotics and information technologies are creating a. Um, uh, a bifurcation uh, or a di- or a divergence in the labor market where those who know how to use the equipment uh, are still going to have access to good jobs, but those who do not are going to be largely displaced. And the big change, you said the word structure, and that's key there, the, the big change in the structure of the labor market is that we used to have this big fat middle mm-hmm. in the labor market where people could find a decent job, and that middle is thinning out with uh, jobs going either to that upper tier or that lower tier. All right. I want to get into the topic of here in a few moments of the service industry. And as we've talked with, um, again, Alan Fryer of the North Carolina Justice Center yesterday related to the economic numbers, which indicate that, well, unemployment numbers are down. But uh, as uh, Alan Fryer and the uh, Justice Center point out, much of that is a result of a discouraged workforce no longer looking for work. And then in the process, uh, Professor Smith, it, it seems that um, we've got folks now that are of the age and, well, interest that they don't want to have to reinvent themselves. Is that going to be a necessity if they, if they want to get out of this um, uh, constant uh, environment of, of low-paying jobs? Is this going to require some major psychological readjustment? Well, I'm I'm always a little concerned when people say they don't want to adapt to uh, reality um, because I, I I think that's just self evidently a um, a difficult proposition if you want to make it in this world. Um, there's there is definitely going to uh, always always and even for us Lockwood. I mean, you're you're I'm sure you're using technology you didn't use ten years yeah. ago, and 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 so am I, right? So I mean, you know, we all have to adjust to uh, to the world around us and learn new skills and so forth. And those who um, invest in in learning those skills are are going to have the upper hand. Um, That said, I I don't see anything specific to North Carolina that's um, eliminating um, our youth or or um, well any part of the uh, of the labor market uh, any more so than at the national level. All right. And of course, this topic of um, uh, the the discouraged workers, uh, is this is this a relatively new phenomenon? Uh, that we've got so many discouraged workers that, uh, you know, again, uh, that you, you, you described the uh, book, uh, The Average is Over. Are we losing that? And you said it was flattening the middle. Uh, is this a relatively new experience for us, uh, economically speaking, and the fact that we've lost this, um, the, if you will, this comfort zone? I think it is, um, but let me be very clear. It's not a North Carolina problem. It's a, it's a national, national problem. I, I, um, 
no, I, I can appreciate that. But it, 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 it makes itself pretty obvious here in North Carolina where we've lost so many manufacturing jobs. Sure. Sure. But, uh, but so on the national level, this is happening, and it is definitely a puzzle. It's a puzzle to, to labor economists. Um, we've got the lowest uh, labor participation rate uh, in decades. Wow. And at the same time, um, most other statistics about the, about the health of the economy seem positive. It seems like um, we have been slowly getting out of the Great Recession, slower than most have hoped, but we are, we are moving in the right direction. And so it is a bit of a puzzle as to, you know, what, what are these people doing? Um, because it's not clear that, that, that they're just being, you know, uh, beach bums or something. Um, it may be that they're becoming um, self-entrepreneurs. It may be that they, more people are going into education. We're we're just frankly unsure right now as to as to what's happened um, in losing that. But again, this is something that's happening uh, everywhere in the United States, not just North Carolina. All right, I want to get back to that here in just a moment with our guest, uh, Professor Adam Smith of Johnson and Wales uh, University in Charlotte. You're listening, of course, to Viewpoints on the Talk Station FM 107 AM 1240. Hey, this is Ben Ball, and we'll get your morning started each weekday from six to nine on Coastal Daybreak. Viewpoints on the talk station, FM 107, AM 1240. We've asked our guest, uh, Professor Adam Smith of Johnson & Wales, to stay with us for just a few more moments. We're talking about <clears throat> the economy and specifically the job market. As we heard just a moment ago, that uh, uh, economist, uh, Professor, you said, are, are a little confused by the uh, current state, uh, state of, of statistics, of statistical analysis, a continuing uh, discouragement in the workforce, yet the opportunities there are out there for job opportunities. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to go to something real quickly and then uh, get on to uh, topics that might have an impact on this as well. Um, we were talking with Alan Fryer yesterday of the uh, North Carolina Justice Center, and he suggested that one of the solutions for getting out of this economic doldrum is greater investment through government. And he mentioned government jobs and, of course, government and infrastructure. I'm, I'm a little uh, jaundiced about the concept of government jobs because for two reasons. One, government by its very nature is not innovative. Uh, it's very uh, defined. Uh, it, it's a matter of fact, I, I think it, it's, it becomes just sort of a, a rote environment, such a, uh, or pardon me, a rote economy if such a thing exists. Now, as far as infrastructure, we see the value of that. But as I pointed out to uh, Mr. Fryer yesterday, much of the development and growth and jobs in North Carolina tend to be in the metropolitan communities, such as where you are there in Charlotte, Charlotte, Mecklenburg, Raleigh Triangle, but in the... Um, predominantly rural communities of North Carolina or less populated communities, we don't have that luxury. Uh, is there is government the only solution? I, I mean, it, just creating government jobs, it, it just seems uh, bothersome to me. Well, it, it, the, what struck me as you were saying that is it seems like a, a, a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Oh. Um, it's It's not, uh, you know, government, as, as you, for all the reasons you listed, government jobs are not going to be a long-term success story for the state. Um, we, need to, uh, we need to invest in what we're good at and, and what's going to lead to dynamic growth, not just sort of short-run uh, opportunism. Uh, and I feel really that's all, all you're going to get. Um, and uh, and that's what we see really any time. I mean, what what it seems like uh, the gentleman's talking about is just a stimulus package, just mm -hmm. kind of a state right. a state stimulus package. And you know, uh, we we see this every time a stimulus package comes up. We see a small blip, and things go back to sort of the way they were. Um, and whether that's worth it or not is 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 probably somewhat context specific. But um, as a long-term solution, uh, it, it doesn't have a very good track record. So I just don't see how that could play well in the state. Interesting uh, comparison, and I appreciate that. I'm sorry you weren't with me yesterday when we were talking with uh, uh, Mr. Fryer of the Justice Center. All right, let's talk about several items that I'm going to ask. Are they having a negative impact on the job market? And again, for those just joining us, to remind you, our guest, uh, Professor Adam Smith, uh, Professor of Economics at Johnson & Wales University. And uh, Professor several items. One, of course, national health care. Uh, you've said earlier, and we, we talked about this, that many employers and businesses uh, have and industries have learned to do more with less through innovation, as a matter of fact, the new technology. But also, there's, uh, to me, a hesitancy and a fear to want to expand in light of the one 
onerous impacts, particularly with the employer mandate on health care, but also the unknowns because things get changed so quickly. Your observation. Well, um, there's a there's a lot coming down the pipe that could um, that that could damage uh, what what positive figures uh, we are having um, with all of these with 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 health care with minimum wage with guarantees of um, of um, overtime these sorts of packages the implication is that you can make labor worth more to an employer and that's a strong assumption it's not necessarily wrong but we have to agree that's a strong assumption and if it doesn't hold uh, the unintended consequences of all that could be severe so for example if we require that you know greater um, health care packages be associated with labor uh, that higher wages higher minimum wages um, uh, other benefits then businesses can respond in a number of ways and not all are going to be uh, very helpful to to workers one could be to hire fewer workers. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, An even worse one could be to not only hire fewer workers, but find ways to use capital um, to replace workers permanently. So um, if we find that labor is, uh, for now and for the foreseeable future, uh, not going to be a cost-effective way of getting um, a certain certain service done, then we can see uh, what machines, what technology is available um, to cut down on our labor cost. And that's not something that, that, you know, labor just bounces back from later on. That's something in place permanently um, and could um, undermine the labor market for a long time. And in the process, and of course, one of the great concerns has been historically in uh, <clears throat> economic circles has been, and I remember the impact of inflation starting in, I, in my lifetime uh, in the 60s and then uh, 70s, and of course, during the 80s. And of course, that was predominantly around energy. We had this inflationary bubble. And of course, as a matter of fact, um, uh, when President Reagan took office, we were looking at, I recall, 18% interest rates, a shocking number. Um, Mm -hmm. The fact that you've got these mandates coming from the federal government to the extent that possibly, and and we're looking in even in the service industry where there obviously is not a a high level of pay or uh, historically, are we looking at the potential of major inflationary factors as well? I, I don't think so. Um, just be, well, at least if we hold monetary policy constant for a moment, I, I don't think it would it would push up cost. I think um, because businesses, of course, uh, would suffer the consequences of those higher costs before the rest of us. Um, it's not clear that they could just put those higher higher costs back on the consumer. Um, and if that's not the case, then what they're going to do is, like I said, they're going to make internal adjustments that will keep their costs down, but in a way that displaces labor, uh, which you know, the, the the easiest way of putting that is just fewer jobs. There'll be fewer jobs available um, to workers as they shift how they actually produce uh, as a result of those policy changes. And then uh, the other activities that uh, impact businesses, regulations. Do we? And, and of course, we talked about minimum wage overtime, national health care, but you have additional regulations as well. Are we are we trying to control the? Uh, the engine too strongly uh, in, through various uh, policy adjustments, everything from health care, minimum wage, and now other regulations? Are we, or, or should, do we need actually more a laissez-faire uh, economic environment? Well, with any kind of a policy change, I think you've got to break it down to the assumptions. You know, what is what is behind what what has to happen in order for that regulation or that policy to work? Mm-hmm. And at least in terms of the the rhetoric we hear, you know, I'm I'm just not hearing. I'm not hearing the economics uh, behind any uh, any of those policies. Um, you know, as I said, with the regulations coming in the labor market, the strong assumption is that you know this is going to be worth it. Employees are still going to be worth it to the employer, um, and even if you uh, even if um, you 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 want to help workers and 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 are sympathetic to that plight, um, you've got to back that assumption. Um, 
Or if you feel like that assumption is wrong, then you can't back the policy, or you've got to adjust the policy accordingly. And so until I hear um, a firmer or more logical economic rationale behind those regulations, you know, uh, you can definitely label me a pessimist as, as in terms of those making positive change. <laughs> Our guest, pessimist and professor of economics at <laughs> Johnson & Wales University, Professor Adam Smith. Professor, one quick second, uh, last question for you. The impact of international uh, uh, stresses and, and competition, we're hearing uh, concerns related to education, the associated uh, 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 concerns that we've got to educate our marketplace for the world uh, economy and to be competitive in the world economy. Is that a primary concern or is that a secondary concern in your thought? Well, in my world, I hear that all the time. And so it's hard not to feel um, a little, uh, you know, uh, the, the, uh, a little burnout about it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I think the thing you got to realize with America is that it's, it's the X factor that seems to keep us um, above, uh, above water. And what I mean by that is uh, the ideas, the ideas tend to emerge from 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 our side um, you could call it maybe the Steve Jobs factor right if you look at um Information entrepreneurs mm -hmm. uh, using new technology in innovative ways. Again, America is, is still very much leading the charge. Um, we're not going to produce the you know the the, the top mathematicians. We're not going to produce uh, the top en engineers per se. But in terms of ideas and innovation, uh, we're still a cut above the rest. And that's sort of what worries me about um, the remarks we were talking about earlier about well whether we need to invest in you know non innovative sectors like government is is that would jeopardize um, what we could bring to the table in terms of that X factor for the future. Our guest, and I thank him for being with us this evening, Professor Adam Smith, again, Assistant Professor of uh, Economics at Johnson & Wales University in Charlotte. And as always, Professor, we do appreciate your time this evening. Okay, thanks, Lockwood. Thanks for having me on. Okay, Viewpoints on the Talk Station, FM 107, AM 1240.